Chapter 7, Uninvited Brothers. Omri was not supposed to ride his bicycle in the road, but then he wasn't supposed to ride it on the pavement either. Not fast at any rate, so he compromised. He rode it slowly on the pavement as far to the corner, then bumped down off the curb and went like the wind. The hardware shop was still open. He bought the seed tray and the seeds and was just paying for them when he noticed something. On the seed pack under the word Maro was written another word in brackets, squash. So one of the three sisters was Maro. On impulse, he asked the shopkeeper, do you know what maize is? Maize, son? That's sweet corn, isn't it? Have you some seeds of that? Outside, standing by Mari's block was Patrick. Hi, hi, I saw you going in. What'd you get? Omri showed him. More presents for the Indian? Patrick asked sarcastically. Well, sort of, if, if what? If I can keep him long enough till they grow. Patrick stared at him. Omri stared back. I've been in Yap, said Patrick. I bought you something. Yeah, what, said Omri. Slowly, Patrick took his hand out of his pocket, held it in front of him, and opened his fingers. In his palm lay a cowboy on a horse with a pistol in one hand pointing upward, or what would have been upward if it hadn't been lying on its side. Omri looked at it silently. Then he shook his head. I'm sorry, I don't want that. Why not? Now you can play a proper game with the Indian. They'd fight. Isn't that the whole idea? But they might hurt each other. There was a pause, and then Patrick leaned forward and asked very slowly and loudly, How can they hurt each other? They're made of plastic. Listen, said Omri, and then stopped and started again. The Indian isn't plastic. He's real. Patrick heaved a deep, deep sigh and put the cowboy back in his pocket. He'd been friends with Omri for years, ever since they'd started school. They knew each other very well, just as Patrick knew when Omri was lying. He also knew when he wasn't. The only trouble was that this was a non-lie he couldn't believe. I want to see him, he said. Omri debated with himself. He somehow felt that if he didn't share with the secret with Patrick, their friendship would be over. He didn't want that. And besides, the thrill of showing the Indian to someone else was something he could do without, couldn't, could not do without much longer. Okay, go on. Go home. Going home, they broke the law even more, riding on the road and with Patrick on the crossbar. They went around the back, way on the alley. In any case, that way no one was happened to see them, even if they looked out the window. Omri said, he wants a fire. I suppose we can't make one indoors. You could, on a tin plate, like for indoor fireworks, Patrick said. Omri looked at him. Let's collect some twigs. Patrick picked up a twig about a foot long. Omri laughed. That's no good. They've got to be tiny twigs like this. He picked some silk slivers off the, pri the privet hedge. Does he want the fire to cook on, said Patrick slowly. Yes. Then that's no use. A fire made of those would burn out in a couple of seconds. Omri hadn't thought of that. What you need, said Patrick, is a little ball of tar. That burns for ages, and you can put the twigs on top to make it look like a real campfire. What a brilliant idea. I know where they've been a tarring a road too, said Patrick. Come on, let's go. No, why not? I don't believe in him yet. I wanna see. All right, but first I have to give this stuff to my dad. There was a de further delay when his father at first insisted Omri fill out the seed tray with compost and plant the seeds in it then and there. But when Omri gave him the corn seed as a present, he said, well, thanks. Oh, all right, I can see you're bursting to get away. You can do the planting tomorrow before school. Omri and Patrick rushed upstairs. At the top, Omri stopped cold. His bedroom door, which was always shut automatically, was wide open. And just inside, crouching side by side with their backs to him, were his brothers. They were so absolutely still that Omri knew they were watching something. He couldn't bear it. They had come into his room without his permission, and they had seen the Indian. Now they would tell everybody. His secret, his precious secret, his alone to keep share, was secret no more. Something broke inside him, and he heard himself scream, Get out of my room! Get out of my room! Both boys spun around. Shut up, you'll frighten him, said Adele at once. Gillian came in to look for his rat, and he found it, and then he saw this absolutely fabulous little house you've made and called me to look at it. Omri looked at the floor. The sea tray with the longhouse, now nearly finished, had been moved into the center of the room. It was that they had been looking at. A quick glance all around showed no sign of the Indian or the horse, but Gillian's tame white rat was on his shoulder. 
I can't get over it, Adele went on. How on earth did you do it without use of glue or anything? It's all done with tiny little threads and pegs and look, Gillian, it's all made of real twigs and bark. It's absolutely terrific, he said, with such an awestruck admiration in his voice that Omri felt ashamed. I didn't, he began, but Patrick, who had been gaping at the longhouse in amazement, gave him a heavy nudge that nearly knocked him over. Yes, said Omri. Well, would you mind leaving now and take that rat? You're not to let him in here. This is my room. And this is my magnifying glass, you know, echoed Gillian, but he was obviously too overcome with admiration to be angry with Omri for pinching it. He was using it now to examine the fine details of the building. I knew you were good at making things, he said, but this is uncanny. You must have fingers like a fairy to tie those witchy little knots. What's that? He asked suddenly. They'd all heard it, a high, faint whining coming from under the bed. Omri was galvanized into action. At all cost, he must prevent their finding out now. He flung himself to his knees and pretended to grope under the bed. It's nothing. All that little clockwork dolphin I got in my Christmas stopping. I must have wound it and suddenly started clicking. You know how they do it. It's quite creepy sometimes. They just suddenly start clicking. By this time, he'd leaped up again and was almost pushing the two older boys out of the room. Why are you in such a hurry to get rid of us? Asked Gillian suspiciously. Just go. You know you have to get out of my room when I asked. He could hear the little horse whining again, and it didn't sound a bit like the dolphin. That sounds like a pony, said Adele. Oh, Beard, it's a pony, a tiny witchy pony under my bed, said Omri mockingly. And at last they went, not without glancing back suspiciously, several times, and Omri slammed the door, bolted it, leaned against it, and closed his eyes. Is it a pony, whispered Patrick? Omri nodded. Then he opened his eyes, lay down again, and peered under the bed. Give me that flashlight from the chest drawers. Patrick gave it to him and lay beside him. They peered together as the beam of probe the light probed the darkness. Crumbs, breathed Patrick, revertently. It's true. The horse was standing, seemingly alone, whining. When the light hit him, he stopped and turned his head. Omri could see a pair of leavings behind him. It's all right, little bear, it's me, said Omri. Slowly, a crest of feathers, then a pair of eyes appeared over the top of the horse's back. Who others, he asked. My brothers, it's okay, they didn't see you. Little bear, here coming, take horse, run, hide. Good, come on out, meet my friend Patrick. Little bear jumped astride the horse and rode proudly out wearing his new cloak and headdress. He gazed up imperiously at Patrick, who gazed back in wonder. Then he nodded to Patrick, who tried several times to say something, but his voice just couldn't come out. Omri's friend, Little Bear's friend, said Little Bear magnanimously. Patrick swallowed. His eyes seemed a danger popping right out of his head. Little Bear waited politely, but when Patrick didn't speak, he rode over to the sea tray. The brothers had brought it out from behind the crate, and they'd been careful, but the ramp had gotten moved. Omri hurried to put it back, and Little Bear rode the horse up to it, dismounted, and tied it by its halter to the post, and had driven into the compost. Then he went calmly on with his work on his longhouse. Patrick licked his lip, swallowed twice more, and croaked out, He's real. He's a real live Indian. I told you. How'd it happen? Don't ask me. Something to do with the cupboard. Or maybe the key. It's very old. You lock classic people inside and they come alive. Patrick goggled at him. You mean, it's not only him, you can do it with any toy? Only plastic ones. An incredulous grin spread over Patrick's face. Then what are we waiting for? Let's bring loads of things to life, whole armies. He sprang forward with biscuit tins. Omri grabbed him. No, wait, it's not that simple. Patrick, his hands already full of soldiers, was making for the cupboard. Why not? Because they are all, you don't see, they'd be real. Real, what do you mean? Little Bear isn't a toy. He's a real man. He really lived. Maybe he's still, I don't know, in the middle of life somewhere in America in 17th something or other. He's from the past. Omri struggled to explain all this to Patrick. I don't get it. Listen, Little Bear has told me about his life. He fought in war, scout people, grown stuff to eat like morrows and stuff, and had a wife. She died. He doesn't know how he got here, but he thinks it's magic, and he accepts magic. He believes it. He thinks I'm some kind of spirit or something. What I mean, Omri persisted, as Patrick's eyes strayed longingly to the cupboard, is that if you put all those men in there, when they came to life, they'd be real men with real lives of their own, from their own times and countries, talking their own languages. 
You couldn't just set them up and make them do what you wanted. They'd do what they wanted, or they might get terrified and run away, or well, or they might try to kill an old Indian or actually die of fright when they see you. Look, if you don't believe me, and Omri opened the cupboard, there lay the body of the old chief, now made of plastic, but still unmistakably dead, and not dead the same way plastic soldiers are made to look dead, but the way real people look, crumpled up and empty. Patrick picked it up, turning it to his hand. He'd put the soldiers down by now. This isn't the one you bought at lunchtime. Yes, crumbs, you see? Where is his headdress? Little Bear took it. He says he's the chief now. It made him even more bossy and a difficult to deal with, said Omri, using a word his mother often used when he was insisting on having his way. Patrick put the dead Indian down hurriedly and wiped his hand on his, the seat of his jeans. Maybe this isn't such fun as I thought. Omri considered for a moment. No, he agreed soberly. It's not fun. They stared at Little Bear. He had finished the shell of his longhouse now. Taking off his headdress, he tucked it under his arm, stooped and entered through the low doorway at one end. After a moment, he came out and looked up at Omri. Little Bear hungry, he said. You get deer, bear, moose? No, he scowled. I say get, why you not get? The shops are shut, besides, added Omri, thinking he sounded rather feeble, especially in front of Patrick. I'm not sure I like the idea of having bears shambling about in my room, or of having them killed. I'll get you meat and a fire, and you can cook it, and that'll have to do. Little Bear looked baffled for a moment, then he swiftly put on the headdress and drew himself to his full height of almost three inches, three and a quarter with his feathers. He folded his arms and glared at Omri. Little Bear, chief now. Chief hunts, kills on meat, not take meat others kill. If not hunt, lose skill with bow. For today, you give meat. Tomorrow, go shop, get bare, plastic, make real. I hunt. Looking up scornfully at the distant ceiling, out under sky, now fire. Patrick, who had been crouching, stood up. He too seemed to be under Little Bear's spell. I'll run and get the tar, he said. No, wait a minute, said Omri. I've got another idea. He ran downstairs. Fortunately, the living room was empty. In the coal scuttle beside the open fireplace was a packet of fire lighters. He broke a fairly large bit off one and wrapped it in a scrap of newspaper. Then he went to the kitchen. His mother was standing at the sink peeling apples. Omri hesitated, then went to the refrigerator. Don't eat now, Omri. It's nearly supper time. Just a tiny bit, he said. There was a lovely chunk of raw meat on a plate. Omri sniffed his fingers, wiped them hard on his sweater to get the stink of the fire lighter off of them, then took a big carving knife from the drawer and with an anxious glance from his mother's back, began sawing off a corner of the meat. Luckily, it was steak and cut easily. Even so, he nearly had the whole plate off the shelf and onto the floor before he got it cut off the corner. His mother swung around just as he closed the refrigerator door. A tiny bit of what, she asked. She often reacted late to things, he said. Nothing, he said, hiding the raw bit of meat in his hand. Mom, can I borrow a tin plate? I haven't got such a thing. Yes, you have. The one you bought Adele to go camping. That's in Adele's room somewhere. I haven't got it. A tiny bit of what? But Omri was already on his way upstairs. Adele was in his room. He would be doing his homework. What do you want? He asked the second Omri crept in. That, uh, plate, you know, your camping one? Oh, that, said Adele, going back to his French. Well, can I have it? Yeah, I suppose so. It's over there somewhere. Omri found it eventually in an old knapsack covered with disgusting bits of baked beans, dry hard as cement. He carried across to his own room. Whenever he'd been away from it for a few minutes, he felt his heart beating in panic as he opened the door for fear of what he might find or not find. The burden of constant worry was beginning to wear him out, but all as he was left was just the same. Patrick was crouching near the seed tray. Little Bear was directing him to take the tops off of several jars of poster paint while he himself fashioned something almost too small to see. It's a paintbrush, whispered Patrick. He cut a bit off with his own hair and he's trying to find a scrap of wood he found about the size of a big splinter. Pour a bit of paint into the lid so he can reach the tip. Meanwhile, he was scalping the dry beans off the plate with his nails. He took the fragment of fire lighter and the twigs out of his pocket and arranged them in the center of the plate. He washed the bit of meat in his bedside water glass. He'd had a wonderful idea for a spit to cook it on. From a flat box in which was his first erector set had once been neatly laid out, which, which was now in chaos. 
He took a rod, ready bent into a handle shape, and pushed this through the meat. Then from small bits of the set, he quickly made a sort of stand for it to rest on with legs on each side of the fire so that the meat hung over the middle of it. Let's light it now, said Patrick, who was getting very excited. Little Bear, come and see your fire. Little Bear looked up from his paints and then ran down the ramp across the carpet and vaulted onto the edge. Omri struck a match and lit the fire lighter, which flared up at once with a bluish flame, engulfing the twigs and the meat at once. The twigs gave off a gratifying crackle while they lasted, but the fire lighter gave off a very ungratifying stench, which made Little Bear wrinkle up his nose. Stink, he cried, spoiled meat. No, it won't, said Omri. Turn the handle of the spit. Evidently, he wasn't much used to the spit, but he soon got the hang of it. The chunk of meat turned and turned in the flame and soon lost its raw red look and began to go gray and then brown. The good juicy smell of roasting beef began to compete with the spirituous week of the firefighter. Mmm, said Little Bear, appreciatively turning, turning till the sweat ran off his face. Meat. He had thrown off his chief's cloak and his chief's shone red. Patrick could take it, couldn't take his eyes off of him. Please, Omri, he whispered, couldn't I have one? Couldn't I choose just one, a soldier or anything, and make him come to life from your cupboard? Next, we have chapter eight, The Cowboy.